New posted trade ideas, Lowe's partnership saving people thousands, actual posted trades, live streams, and Q&A with Kevin. Why are you not a course member yet taking advantage of that 50% off coupon code link down below, especially when the price goes up faster than inflation goes up? Boy, wouldn't you rather buy here than here? Hopefully I see you. Use the link down below and join the programs on building your wealth. Hey everyone, me Kevin here. This great reset and recession, which is probably already here, is confusing everyone. And in this video, you're going to get a complete update on what's going on with the latest data. We'll see the tension at the Federal Reserve and we'll learn what we just heard from earnings at companies like Delta and JP Morgan. We'll touch on Trade Desk and GoEV as well, and we'll touch on valuations. Let's get started first. Jobless claims came in at 244,000 this week. The estimate was 235. This is the highest that we have seen in jobless claims since November. And it makes sense because the Federal Reserve wants to see some tightening in jobs. They want to put pressure on jobs so that way they can try to put pressure on inflation. If people become less uncertain that their job is secure, maybe they'll spend less money and maybe we'll actually see demand go down. So that way, pressure on jobs, pressure on inflation. This is why you've seen companies like Compass lay off 10% of their workforce, Redfin 6% of their workforce, JP Morgan laid off 1,000 people in mortgages in June, which is actually no surprise because when they reported earnings today, we learned that they lost a ton of money in their mortgage department. Tesla's laying off folks on their all autopilot team with uh, Mr. Karpathy now leaving, who is essentially the de facto leader of the entire autopilot team, leaving bulls and bears questioning, does that mean autopilot is actually much further away from from success or does it mean autopilot is much closer to success the debate will rage but Google is also essentially freezing hiring for the rest of the year and Facebook has given us multiple warnings of layoffs coming so no surprise that we're starting to see the jobless claims number sneak up now jobless claims rising was just part of the problem that we got this morning because the PPI or the producer price reading came in completely off of the chart and this isn't good because it's just another inflation pressure. Look, yesterday we were expecting 8.8% inflation year over year. What did we get? We got 9.1%. Today we look at producer prices. Did we get any con any sort of consolation, anything to calm us down? We were expecting 10.7. What did we get? We got 11.3 which is the highest level since March. Because remember, we've kind of seen inflation do this weird thing where it's run up to this peak in March, uh, and then it's kind of come down a little bit in April, and then now it's kind of shooting past it. And this is kind of reiterating now a lot of people's belief that, oh no, folks, if inflation keeps pulling this off and we don't actually get a strong U-turn down in inflation, this is kind of like what Michael Burry told us, 50% to go, which is also what we're seeing in documents like this, which say phase one of the bear market might be complete, but we got phase two to go. So oh, naturally, after these numbers, yesterday, the swap market started pricing in this potential for even a 100 basis point hike or a 1% hike. Now, some of this has been walked back because even the Federal Reserve doesn't know how to respond to this. Mr. Bostick told us last night that after that CPI read, Everything is in play, essentially implying that, yeah, 100 basis points is in play. Loretta Mester tells us that we are going to go way beyond neutral. And when the market freaked out and started pricing in 100 basis points, the Federal Reserve sent out Mr. Waller today to try to soothe everyone and calm everyone down. But every time the Fed tries to calm something down, I feel like they're just getting ready to hit us over the backside of the head when we're not looking with some other bad news. Mr. Waller comes back and says, well, 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 hey, look, let's not let's not get carried away here. We're in a very unique situation. Uh, we're in a situation where if we hike too fast, we could actually end up to leading to very high unemployment. And our nightmare scenario would actually be having very high unemployment while we're trying to push down high inflation. That would be the nightmare scenario. And so Waller actually just supports a 75 basis point hike because he says that'll bring us to neutral. Right now we sit at 1.5. Hiking 75 would bring us to 2.25, which he believes is the neutral level. Now most people actually believe that 2.5 is the neutral level. 
All this does is just lead to more confusion in markets because it's like, okay, so what is it? Like some people say it's two and a half. Some say it's 2.25. Jay Powell says it's, I don't know, it's somewhere around there, but we don't actually have a science that says what neutral is. And again, when you've got Loretta Mester and Bostic saying everything's on the table and we're going to go above neutral, come on, bro. What is the answer? Well, all we know is what markets are telling us and markets are right now pricing in that we're going to get to 3.7% as a Fed funds rate by December. This 2.25 potentially uh, via the next meeting, which would be a 75 basis point hike and we'll be there as soon as July. And this is what markets are reacting to right now. This is why we're seeing QQQ back to that 280 level, which seems to be roughly, and I'm not going to use the word floor because every time I do, we break it, seems to be roughly a place that the QQQ just likes to relax a little bit. Now, to some degree, you can't really blame the Federal Reserve right now because they're trying to realistically fight extremely high inflation while unemployment is really, really low. So they don't actually have to worry so much about that nightmare scenario of having super high unemployment. So we don't really actually have to listen to Waller. We could just go ahead and hike, hike, hike because we're not even close to facing ultra high unemployment. That would be very, very bad and it's very stagflationary, but we're not facing that. Look at the U6 level of unemployment. Now the U6 measure is a broader measure of unemployment. It includes folks who are marginally attached, kind of like, eh, you know, I don't really need to be working right now, but I am, or I'm about to lose my job, right? That's your marginally attached folks. It also includes people who are discouraged from looking for a job because they've tried and they just can't find a job anymore. Maybe because their skill set became, uh, you know, useless or whatever. They got replaced by a robot and they turned into a Luddite. I don't know, whatever. Anyway, so you've got marginally attached, discouraged, and then you've got underemployed. That's your U6 measure. This would be like, hey, I'm not able to work enough to make enough money, right? This measure is at 6.7%, which obviously is higher than the unemployment rate where it is now. 3.6%. It's quite a bit higher, uh, but it's still the lowest ever on record. So this is why the market is so confused because it's like, why? Well, like yesterday we're good. Like the market was pricing in as high, as high as an 86% chance of a hundred basis point hike. And I was all for it. I'm like, just give it to us already. Just do it rip the freaking bandage off. Now you get Waller to try to walk back this stuff going, well, we don't want to cause super high unemployment. We want to be careful. We don't want to be too drastic here. Meanwhile, they can't get a grip on any kind of of the inflation problems we have. And so now markets are only pricing in. We saw a little bit of a rebound intraday in the stock market. Now markets are only pricing in a 50% chance of a hundred basis point hike. So I don't really understand fully what the Fed's trying to engineer, but it just seems like the Fed is really, really nervous about actually putting on their big boy pants and doing what needs to be done. Now, to some degree, and this is the other flip side, to some degree, we actually do see a lot of measures of inflation that are kind of saying, maybe the Fed's going to be right. I mean, after all, you've got commodities falling. Even iron ore is now following copper down, and these are industrial metals, which are waving flags of a recession, red flags of a recession, right? Supply chain constraints are relaxing, and break-evens are falling very, very quickly. You could see these graphically as well. Don't just take my word for it. Take the floating heads word for it, which is supply chain pressures are easing, and you can kind of see what supply chain pressures look like. We can look at the COVID disaster right here when we first had our supply constraints index spike. Then, of course, into 2021, we had uh, Omicron and Delta roughly around here. Uh, And then here we sit now sort of in the beginning of 2022. And yeah, we had a bump in supply chain issues because of the war, but we're actually falling to levels that we haven't seen since roughly the first quarter of 2021, meaning supply chain constraints are beginning to ease. Graphic cards, I mean, every single analyst that I read a report on is talking about how we're expecting a massive flood of graphic cards and a big oversupply of chips soon. Of course, we don't have that oversupply yet. They just talk about it. And who knows? Analysts aren't always right. Uh, But here's the commodities price index. You could see Q2 compared to last year Q2, we're actually seeing metal, 
oil, food prices, commodity prices in general, they're all going down to again. So again, to some degree, may, maybe the Federal Reserve is going to be right here. I mean, this is that chart again with the 10 and five year break even right here, showing us that the bond market is saying, hey, CPI should be coming down soon. It just hasn't yet. It's over here peaking. At the same time, we're seeing yield curves invert that haven't been inverting, like the five-year, 30-year just inverted again this morning briefly. And these are all recessionary signals. So the Fed is really stuck between a rock and this hard place where if we have to keep hiking aggressively to deal with that high inflation number and we're going to keep hiking, we might literally be hiking while we're in the midst of a recession. Uh, and, and that's scary for markets. That creates even more uncertainty. And maybe they think, hey, if they think we're so dead set on inflation and the market's like, wow, the Fed's not even paying attention to the fact that commodities are getting less expensive or the bond market says inflation is going to go down. Well, gee, they're going to be hiking substantially during a recession. Let's lay off more people. You know, maybe they're playing 4D chess with us. The other example of what they could be is they could be this computer code, ID10Ts. I don't know. Let me know in the comments what you think. But we got some really important things to think about and talk about right now, starting with JP Morgan. So JP Morgan is warning us of a waning consumer confidence and the largest quantitative tightening cycle that we've ever seen, along with a war and high inflation. JP Morgan's profit fell 28% in the second quarter and they bumped their allowance of four losses more than they did in the first quarter. I mean, here's your Q1 allowance for losses, which is just under 500 million. Here it is just above 500 million. Doesn't remotely hold a candle to the over 10 and over $8 billion in losses and reserves that JP Morgan took back at the beginning of the pandemic. So really, it doesn't seem like they see that big of fears, but then again, even Jamie Dimon tells us they might just not know. This first note was fascinating on the consumer from the JP Morgan earnings call. They note that, yeah, the consumer is spending 35% more year over year on gas and 6% more on recurring bills and non-discretionaries. But what they really want to point out is despite these greater spending areas, the consumer has, quote, yet to pull back in discretionary spending. And this includes the lower income segments with travel and dining growing at 34% year over year overall. This is incredible, folks. So even the lower income segments aren't pulling back on discretionary spending yet. They're still spending on travel and dining. Let's go to the next one. While home lending revenue was down 26% year over year and credit card outstanding balances were up 16%, as folks probably had less stimulus money to maybe pay down their debt or keep their debt down, Jamie Dimon seems excited. He says, look, even though we have storm clouds ahead of us, even though we're going to be going through a storm, we think that the storm provides us with opportunities. The economy is going to be bigger in 10 years. Our company is going to be bigger in 10 years. Despite all of this, Jamie Dimon goes as far as saying right now, the consumer is in great shape. So even if we go into a recession, we're entering that recession with less leverage and in far better shape than we did in 2008 and 2009. And sure, jobs may disappear because things happen, but the consumers are in great shape. So golly, man, this is just, you know, I hate to say that this time is different. But let's be real, we've got this insane inflationary environment where both CPI and PPI are off the chart. But the bond market is telling you, no, 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 don't worry. Just be patient. Inflation is going to go down. But you've got investors freaking out, going Fed, do something. The inflation is running away. Like even I say, Fed, put on your big boy pants. But I think the Fed's not because they're trying to play this 4D chess of going, uh, we actually think the consumer is pretty strong. They're going to survive. We think that jobs are pretty strong. And we kind of still, even though we don't want to say it, we kind of think that inflation is going to be transitory and we don't want to kill these things because these things are actually good. And the last thing we want to do is get really aggressive against the consumer and jobs if inflation does end up being transitory. So let me put it this way. If the Federal Reserve ends up hiking 75 in July, even though everyone's screaming for a hundred, the Fed actually still believes that inflation is transitory. But 
There are some people at the Fed who's like, no, just hike already and then wait. But it's this kind of confusion that makes the market so topsy-turvy right now. It seems like bad news is bad news and good news is good news for a few minutes and then it turns into bad news. Uh, and then we have a few days of a rally, like what, a week and a half ago, the NASDAQ rallied five days in a row and everybody got excited and then, oh, it fell right back down. So then I figure, okay, well, maybe maybe the Delta earnings will give us a little bit of insight. And so Delta, by the way, says they remain confident that they can earn $7 per share by 2024. Now that I thought was really incredible because for a company with a $29.28 share price at the time of this recording, that $7 in EPS works out to a multiple of 4.2x for 2024 earnings. That's really, really low. Now look, they got a whole lot of debt. And this is a company that tells us bluntly that they want to take their extra cash flow and pay off debt. At the same time, they're still buying extra planes though, so they're also investing in their fleet. But they make it very, very clear that debt reduction is a big, big, big priority of theirs. But what else do they tell us and what do they tell us about the consumer? Are we seeing that recession yet over at Delta? And what do they say is actually that looking forward, quote, we are seeing strong or seeing demand and pricing strength carry into late summer and fall as demand remains strong. Well, great. The more these companies talk about pricing strength, the more inflation we're probably going to be getting from the airlines. And that's probably one of the last places we need more of this. And they also mention that what seems to be driving a lot of their revenue right now isn't main cabin purchases. It's actually their premium products which I thought this was really fascinating because if we jump over to this section right here, they suggest that 60% of their revenue comes from premium products and non-ticket revenue sources. This is incredible because if you think about it, they and they say, this just blows my mind, they say that only 10% of their total revenue comes from the main cabin. So if you're like one of those people who gets on a plane and you're just like, dude, just give me like the $200 ticket to New York. I'm gonna sit back here. I'm gonna bring my own peanuts. I'm not gonna buy anything. I'm not getting the extended leg room. I'm not checking a bag. I ain't doing jack squat. Now you're one of the people that's only contributing 10% or, or to the 10% section of their revenue. 60% comes from things like their credit cards where you know you, they partner with American Express for credit cards like the Delta Reserve card uh, or or seat upgrades or baggage or other miscellaneous fees uh, that get them more money. This I thought was incredible. And the fact that Delta doesn't see demand weakening is a sign that people are still paying for these upgrades. People are still paying enough. They also acquired another record number of Sky Miles members in the quarter and achieved record spend on their Amex co-brand. In fact, they expect to get $1.4 billion from American Express, because again, they co-brand a credit card, uh, a few credit cards together. I think it's a platinum and the uh, reserve, which is 35% higher than June of 19. That's before the pandemic. So before the pandemic, like comparing to right before the pandemic, they're getting 35% more money from their partnership with American Express, which just a fun additional note in the, uh, uh, in an analyst review of American Express that I was reading, I was reading that American Express skews to its highest end customers with the highest FICO scores and American Express gets most of their money from transaction fees on spending volume versus other cards. So in other words, if Delta is making a lot of money on the American Express card and kind of a, a revenue share of how much people are spending on the American Express card, then that means people are still spending like crazy, certainly in the premium sector. But then we combine that with JP Morgan, we're like, no, even JP Morgan says even the lower income demographic are spending more. What's really happening is just everyone is spending more money. And so then I decided, okay, well, can I figure out like how much money do people have uh, on hand right now in, in their checking accounts? And here you go. Top 25%. You actually have more, you're actually almost at a peak here in terms of money on hand, just above uh, $6,000 for the four week rolling average for households. In the bottom quartile, you're not seeing a substantial decline in cash on hand. In fact, over here in the second quarter, you see a tick up in cash on hand for every single demographic. Of course, it's not as high as what we saw during the pandemic peaks here, uh, but 
it's still ticking up, not down. So people have more money in their bank accounts. Like, well, this is so weird. And I think the Fed is looking at this going, yeah, we don't want to kill this, man. This is a good economy. Like, if we could just get inflation to disappear, this is a booming economy. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Uh, now, I mean, that's not to say we're not going to have problems because we're fighting the Fed here. But boy, oh boy, this is somewhat of an interesting set of data. But then Delta Airlines analysts bluntly asked Delta if they see any weakness in the consumer from the American Express side in their discussions with American Express and at Delta. And they see that we're not seeing any indicators yet. And we're looking for that. Again, reiterating that the consumer remains strong and the Fed behind closed doors is panicking because it's like got high inflation, but we don't want to crush what behind the closed doors, what behind the curtains, it's actually still a pretty strong consumer. Now, just a side note, I thought this was fascinating. It looks like just the American Express co-brand deal that Delta has with Amex it's probably going to end up working out to 10% of their total revenue. That's kind of crazy that literally just a credit card co-brand makes up 10% of an airline's revenue, but uh, it does. So fun fact. Okay. Wow. Now you have to know this. Things are different in Europe. And the reason things are different in Europe is why the US dollar and the euro actually fell below parity today. That means the dollar at one point this morning was actually worth more than the euro. Right now they're teetering at basically a dollar is equal to a dollar, which I haven't seen at any point in my life. And I like traveling to Europe and usually I'm like, I'm used to the euro being like a buck 30 or a buck 40 or whatever, you know, before the pandemic. And, and, and you know, it costs you more money to trade the dollar for those. But no, now they're at one to one and this morning, the dollar was actually stronger than the euro at, at one point. The dollar is something that's very interesting right now. And if you want to see something crazy about the dollar, I'll pull it up for you. It is absolutely nuts. But the dollar is trading in this really, really long-term uptrend. And this is probably going to beget uh, a larger, much larger video, I would say. But if you look at this crazy inverse ETF on the dollar. This is what you get. And this is the weekly inverse ETF on the dollar. So as this chart goes down, the dollar is actually getting stronger. And you can see we are on this crazy trend line that goes all the way back to about 2010. And we're literally sitting at one of these bounces at the bottom over here. Absolutely wild how strong the dollar is right now. Pretty crazy. Now, how much longer can that last? Who knows? Personally, I don't think it's going to last for more than a year, but it's something that could last for quite a while, especially since we've got a lot of concerns that Europe is going to go into a deeper, scarier recession, which is ultimately going to drive more people to the dollar and US denominated bonds as a flight to safety. The Shell CEO came out this morning and says, worst case scenario, we might have to ration gas. It's going to be a really tough winter in Europe. Side note, the Nord Stream 1 is down for a 10-day maintenance. It's offline for 10 days. So guess what Germany is doing? Germany has to go into their stockpiles. And when they go into the stockpiles, depleting their stockpiles of natural gas, while the Nord Stream 1 is down for maintenance, Putin's probably just laughing his butt off because he's like, ha, 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 you go through your stockpiles and maybe I won't even turn on the Nord Stream 1 again. You'll just be screwed, which is leading and helping lead German investor confidence to fall to its lowest levels since the debt crisis of 2011. That's way back when the acronym, the PIGS came up. Uh, if you know what this means, say it down in the comments. It's, I'm just going to tell you, Portugal, Italy, Greece, and Spain, right? These are considered the uh, debt pigs, at least, of Europe or were back in 2011. And so you've got a lot of uncertainty in Europe. And this means we could actually end up being in this weird situation where while we face super high inflation and we have to hike rates here in the United States, we could end up being in a situation where Europe says, you know what, we just have to hold still because we're in a recession. And so that's why you're seeing more of that flight to safety again to the United States. 
really, really, really weird times. But again, the Fed can't pay attention to Europe. The Fed has to focus on America. We just know that we're probably going to see a deeper recession in Europe than in the United States. Uh, but the Fed doesn't want to make the mistake of trying to uh, be so aggressive that we also end up in the muddy pit with Europe. Like, ideally, which is very hard to do, probably not going to happen, but ideally, we have a soft landing. And I mean, you know, best wishes to the other folks, but if they have a hard landing, it's not our problem if we can have a soft landing here in the United States. And I think that's sort of where the Fed's like, uh, what do we do, man? Like Europe is having problems. They got really high inflation, but they've got all these other things that basically are going to push them into recession, especially these high energy prices, which they have really no control over because com uh, countries like Germany are like, oh, let's shut down our nuclear power plants. We don't need those. We got cheap gas from Russia. And then Putin goes crazy. And what do you get? You got, oh no, turn the nukes back on. It's crazy. Okay. Now folks, now this might leave a lot of you wondering, what do we do? Jack, what do we do? Buy the dip. Yeah, I mean, look, you're either short the dollar or you're going long on equities if you think the Fed is going to be right. If you think they can actually engineer a soft landing or a recession that's not so bad. If you think the Fed is going to fail, if you think their confusion is because they're little pansy babies and they are going to fail, then you should not be in equities. It's that simple. Now we just have to talk about a couple of other crazy things going on. The first thing that's going on is valuations of private companies are likely to get slashed a lot. Now the Fed doesn't really pay attention to some of these things, so probably done really talking about the Fed, but these are just some other important things for you to know, is that valuations at companies like Stripe are getting slashed. Stripe just cut their internal valuation 28% from $40 to $29. You've got uh, about 25 to 30% of Americans saying their next vehicle will be an electric vehicle, which hopefully is exciting for Tesla. And there's a lot of excitement right now going around uh, Go EV. Go EV, of course, is Canoe. The stock ticker is Go EV. They got signed up for a military demo, which is really worthless. Like, okay, yeah, show off your vehicle, but hey, I don't want to sound like just a fudster bear or whatever on canoe. But let me just say, I know they got their little Walmart partnership and stuff, but I'm just going to throw this up on screen. This is a company with $104 million in cash. And don't even bother going over their cash flow statement because they just burned $125 million as a net loss in the last quarter using $120 million in cash, but having a net loss of 120. Uh, oh, oop, that's Delta. Going over here though, you look at Canoe, it's like, yikes, man. In my opinion, the only way this partnership makes sense is if Walmart gets some kind of substantial stake in Canoe. And if they don't end up ramping their manufacturing, Walmart's going to get burned on this deal. I think Walmart had to have ended up giving Canoe some kind of large set of money, like maybe $200 million or whatever, just to fund the next quarters of growth to actually start trying to see some vehicles come out of the factory line. And if those don't come out within the next year, this company could go bankrupt or Walmart will just own an EV company. <laughs> That's my expectation. But at least I will say it's better news than what happened to Trade Desk, which is down a good chunk today. What happened to Trade Desk? They didn't get the Netflix partnership. Instead, guess who did? Microsoft. I don't know how many people saw that one coming, especially since we saw the CFO from Netflix end up working at Trade Desk. Maybe they didn't like that CFO. But folks, we're in crazy times. Check out the programs on Building Your Wealth, link down below, and we'll see you in the next one.